Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Ethics and Science. This is lecture 19, direct follow-up to lecture 18. And what we're going to do today is go through a case study. So this is really just one long exploration of something that I want you to talk about in your discussion post for the week. So without further ado, I will share my screen and we'll get into it. Now you might ask yourself, and I think I talked about it already in the previous lecture, why are we doing it this way? That's because the rest of the class is more or less just explorations of issues facing science today, and especially when it comes to public policy for science. So this is a way to sort of cap off, you know, our science and policy discussion as we've been having it and launch us into what's coming next, where we're going to be tackling specific issues together. Um, using the same meme as before, because I am quite tired and still recovering from a little bit of a cold. It was not coronavirus because folks in my house were tested and that didn't come out to be that. Um, but, you know, feeling tired after dealing with being sick for this last week. So this is our discussion post for this week. I want you to provide your answer to the major questions posed by the case study explored in this video. And I will post these slides to the discussion board. I will not accidentally delete them like I've done in previous times. Um, so what's the background here? This is in page 234 and page 235 of our textbook. In 2005, the journal Science published the complete genetic sequence, the genome of the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, and then previous to that, you know, there was a researcher who actually went and dug up frozen bodies of people that had died of Spanish flu. This was the end of a long piece of research that took decades. And this decision to publish was approved by the US by a US governmental advisory board. And you know, we know that other deadly viruses and bacteria have been synthesized or modified for the purposes of threat assessment or academic research in other cases. And so the big question here is what are the ethics of giving the direct information on how to recreate a deadly virus? Yeah, is this ethical? Are there ways that it might help? And I think there are actually ways that this might be a more than academically, but morally useful thing, but it carries a significant amount of risk. And this is where, you know, like it says in our book, but also I'm going to say here, we need to weigh, you know, as a society, threats, risks, and benefits all together. So here are our questions. Should research that reproduces or modifies a deadly pathogen take place at all? What are the risks in this kind of research? Should the full reproducible genetic sequence be published? Should parts be redacted maybe? As in, you know, do you publish everything except for a key step so that it can't actually be made by anybody else? Are there studies that are too dangerous to be made public? And, you know, if that's the case, what would that study be? And who should make the decision on whether this research, this or that piece of research can be done and published and why? Finally, what measures can be taken to prevent and detect potential dangers? And these are measures that are going to have to be taken by whoever you choose as your answer for who should make the decision, right? So in answering these questions, what we might wanna do is consider Cass's three major questions, which are, what is desirable about this practice? And then is it feasible or what is desirable about limiting it? Because there are reasons that the practice you might wanna limit could be desirable to actually undertake. And there are reasons why it might be desirable to prevent it. Feasibility, can you realistically set limits on this or is it just something kind of gross that you can't stop? And then wisdom, you know, is it wise to set limits on something? And why is it wise to limit it? So let's consider a few things. First, you know, considering should research that reproduces a, or modifies a deadly pathogen take place at all? And there are reasons for it. One reason for it might be that knowledge of one disease could, be, could give better information on others. Um, one of the early, one of the most promising pieces of research in terms of COVID vaccinations ended up coming out of a vaccine that was being developed for SARS, you know, viruses that are directly related, research that was able to jump from one virus to the other, it really helped. And then what about other researchers could use this genome sequence to develop treatments? You know, assuming that there are actually good people who are going to read your research, 
well, couldn't they use it to develop research that would actually help people? Just because you're publishing information on something dangerous doesn't mean it's going to be used dangerously, right? And then finally, what if research like this might give us a hand up if you know someone else gets there first and misuses it? I'm very skeptical about arguments that involve, you know, well, what happens if somebody who's a bad actor gets a hold of it just because it feels a little too science fiction-y for me, but it might not be that way for you. And you might have a valid perspective that I don't, that I'm not seeing, you know, educate me, please. And then reasons against, and this is going to be, you know, reasons against a lot of the time as we move through this, unintended consequences. You know, we can say with a lot of certainty that the researcher who published the genome of that particular virus did not want people to pick it up and make, you know, bioweapons with it. He probably had more altruistic ideas in mind. But as we have seen, there are un unintended consequences and sometimes the wrong people get a hold of something or sometimes, you know, there's an outbreak in a lab or something. But we do have reasons for. What about, you know, what are the risks in this kind of research? It is possible that you could accidentally reintroduce a deadly disease to a population unequipped to fight it. You know, this is something that science fiction has dealt with forever, right? And we've seen that, you know, COVID-19, it wasn't developed in a lab. You know, there's not really any evidence for that. But we have a global population that was not equipped to fight it originally. We're getting better at it. We're developing vaccines. I'm going to get vaccinated soon. I'm excited about it. But every once in a while, a pathogen does get its way out that the population is not equipped to deal with. And then we have to develop all these ways to deal with it. And there are painful consequences. And so you might want to say, well, let's not play with fire. These things happen naturally already. Let's not make them happen unnaturally. And that's a fair thought. We might also say we could accidentally create new and deadly variants. Again, definitely not someone's intention. It could happen, I suppose. And then there's you know the bad actors that could use this research to cause harm. I'm not sold on the idea typically because the creation of a virus in a lab takes a lot of work, takes a lot of resources. And I'm just not certain that a small group of people intending to cause harm actually have those resources. I could be wrong. Then, you know, should the full reproducible gen genetic sequence be published? You know, should it be redacted? Are there studies that are just too dangerous to be made public? So why would you publish it? You know, like we said previously, others could use this research for moral ends. And then, you know, just for yourself, a major discovery like this could be a huge boost to your own career. You know, nobody's doing science for free unless you're, you know, a monk or something, and then you're probably not doing much science these days. And then, you know, you could also say if you're a big adherent to the linear model, and there is wisdom there, that what the public does with research is not the researcher's concern. You know, that does have some wisdom to it. And why not publish or redact or redact? I'm sorry. Yeah, why not publish it? Why would you redact it? Well, again, potential dangers and risk. And if you are against the linear model, and there are reasons to be against it, which we talked about last week, there's also reasons to be for it. Maybe you would say the scientist is responsible. And if your research is used in a way that harms people and there's blood on your hands, you know, if you want to be extremely rhetorical about it, it's an option. It's a thought. Whether or not it's the exact right answer. I'm not going to give you a right answer. I want you to come up with your own. So who should make the decision, you know, on whether research can be done and published, you know, why and how? And this turns out to be a really difficult question. You know, it's not easy to answer just right out of hand. Because what we know is that existing laws and regulations might not cover new discoveries and avenues of research, even if they're dangerous. And we have a system in this country called ex post facto laws. They're illegal. We can't make those where we can't you know, prosecute someone after we make something illegal. You can only prosecute them if they committed the crime while it was illegal. As in, you know, if I'm chewing gum and then they make it illegal to chew gum, I can't be prosecuted if I chewed gum before. Silly example, but, you know, present regulations might not cover the thing anyway. And then just how would you enforce putting limits on research anyway? You know, you could have an oversight board read every proposed study, but 
wouldn't this just slow things down considerably and move research to other places? Probably. And then what are our available policy op um, options? And this is not a definitive list. You could allow universities and publications to make the decision themselves, in which case you have no external oversight. You just trust that the people who are in charge of the scientific enterprise will act morally. And if folks are truly educated in ethics, maybe that is a reasonable assumption to make. You know, at least then they're not going to be beholden to you know, whoever is presently in power, right? Because that's one of the strange things about how our government works is that our regulations tend to change every four to eight years because there's a new sheriff in town and now everybody has to follow a new set of rules and eight years later, we're gonna have to follow less rules and it, it makes things difficult for having consistency. You could also just limit or exclude funding for potentially dangerous projects, in which case, you know, this is soft oversight. People would have to get funding elsewhere. They might have to fund it themselves, just making it more difficult to do dangerous research. It's an option. And then, you know, we have government oversight agencies and there are various levels of control here, right? Depending on the agency and the project, you know, the, the ATF, you know, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, regulates things quite differently than the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, regulates things quite differently than the EPA, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency. It depends on who your overseer is and how strict they're going to be, which again comes back to the political side of things, which is who's presently in power and how much do they care to enforce something. And some concluding thoughts here, stuff that I've just been rolling around in my head as I think about the case study myself. So how one deals with this case is really going to depend heavily on your approach to the linear model. You know, if you are a big adherent, adherent to the linear model and there are reasons to be, then external oversight doesn't make any sense, right? Because science produces morally neutral work that then gets pushed out to society and society makes the call. And so you don't need external oversight. Yeah, publish the work. Don't worry about what happens with it it'll be people who oversee what's done with it that'll be the ones to have to make the moral decision. And then something else I was thinking about, and it came up previously, is that in some cases, scientists overseeing science policy might actually lead to harsher restrictions than we think. You know, we've kind of been going along with a line of thinking in this class that scientists would not want to be regulated. And that's not necessarily true. You know, people who understand the dangers might set up harsher regulations. For example, climate scientists. If we put climate scientists in charge of our climate policy, my guess would be that these long-term goals that are actually much more reachable in the short term would be shorn up. You know, people who understand the danger are going to make the rules stricter. That's just a simple thought for that. So I'm going to go back to the actual list of questions in case you want to pause the video for those. And we can kind of end it here. What I want you to do is I want you to answer these questions, 250 words or more on the case study we had previously. I will also throw some other notes into our discussion post on the week that this is due. Other than that, I know this is a very short video. I went long in the previous one and I want you to, with your time for class this week, really go through this exercise and just, you know, come to a decision, really weigh the options. Anyway, that is all I have for you for this video. I hope that you are staying healthy and well. And if you need anything in terms of preparation for the final, I'm going to start working on that too, just as soon as I get through the next week of lectures. I want you to all have a good day, have a good week, and I will see you in our discussion post soon.